Restaurant Unstoppable, episode 307. It's all about training your staff, training, training, training. And I know so many businesses say, oh, you can't train staff. No, you have to train staff. You have to train them sometimes a hundred times. Are you ready for it factors, success stories, failures, and bombs of restaurant industry knowledge? Then join Eric Cacciatore and today's incredible guest as they share what it takes to become unstoppable. Are you opening a restaurant and stressing out with where to start? Or perhaps you've already opened your restaurant and you're finding yourself completely overwhelmed with the day-to-day task that only you know how to do. If you feel this way, I've got good news. You don't have to do it alone, nor should you regain control of your business and your life with restaurantowner.com. And if you go to restaurantowner.com slash unstoppable, you will get a 10 day pass for only $1. Get on it. Hiring a consultant to train your staff and to improve your restaurant can be expensive. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could just get advice from world champion baristas and leading restaurant consultants without spending thousands of dollars? Tipsy believes you should have the chance to learn new skills whenever you need to, which is why they have hundreds of hospitality courses available for only $9 a month. To give you a little something extra, as a restaurant unstoppable listener, you can also get 50% off your first month. All you got to do is click Click the tipsy banner in the show notes. Get on it. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, Chef Marcus Giuliano. Chef, tell me, are you feeling unstoppable today? I'm always feeling unstoppable. (laughs) Yes, sir. Especially today. Oh, man. Awesome. And before we go any further, I just want to make sure I put emphasis on thanking you uh, for being an advocate for our broken food system, supporting local businesses and indep- independent businesses, and just really being a shining example of what food done right looks like. Uh, I needed to get that out of the way. We're not going to dive into that yet. There will be plenty of time to talk about it, but I just had to get that out of the way early. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. So Chef Marcus Giuliano is an award-winning chef, green restaurateur, real food activist, professional speaker, restaurant consultant, and ultra marathoner. In addition to successfully owning and operating the first green certified restaurant in the Hudson Valley, Aroma Time Bistro, Chef Marcus has begun to devote his time consulting and troubleshooting for other restaurants. Chef Marcus has launched activist slash watchdog oriented sites, including no farm salmons.com chef on a mission.com and the controversial food fraud tv.com you can also check out 50 mistakes.com where chef marcus shares 50 most common mistakes restaurant owners make and obviously this is just scraping the surface i can't wait to learn more about you chef but before we dive into who you are and what you're all about let's let's get that motivational inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra what do you got for us Whoa. Okay. Wow. There's so many good quotes out there. You know, um, I, I always go back to the, to, to the Henry Ford quote, whether you think you can or you can't, you're probably right. Mm. You know, it's just, it's as simple as that and profound as that. And don't get me wrong. There's a lot, like I said, I love all the Grant Cardone quotes, the Gary V quotes. I'm all about quotes, but when it comes down to the basics, Henry Ford had it right. Whether you think you can or you can't, You're probably right. Perception is reality. If you perceive you can't do it, you will not be able to do it. And the first person you need to convince is yourself. Uh, I love it. That's a great way to get this interview started. Um, So I gave the listeners just an aerial view of who you are, uh, what you got going on. But why don't you dive deeper into your current uh, restaurant and what else you got going on? Absolutely. So I've been here 14 years at my current restaurant, Aroma Time Bistro. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm a professionally trained chef. I had 12, 15 years of experience before we opened up. Uh, I've been in the business since I was 14 as a waiter. I'm 43 years old now, so it looks like almost 30 years I've been in the industry waiting tables and cooking and running my business the last 14. Uh, I've been in a couple places across the country. I've been in West Virginia. I've been in Colorado a couple times. I love the mountains. I love skiing. I was uh, grew up in Colorado as a kid, so going back was like a homecoming for me. 
Uh, I've been in London, worked in London for a while. And uh, just as a young chef apprentice, I really just wanted to learn and travel. And that's what exa- exactly did, just building my resume. And I always stress this point to to young professionals, young chef apprentices, students. Um, I just did a great uh, talk at the, where I graduated culinary school from. But I always stress this, never take a job for the money. Mm-hmm. Take a job for what you're going to learn. Mm-hmm. So if there's any chef students out there listening to this, young chef apprentices, Take a job for what you're going to learn. You've already paid 50 grand for culinary school in most cases. Why not take a job for two bucks less an hour where you're going to learn a valuable skill? And people get caught up with, oh, I want to make this, I want to make that. And they take a job and it's basically they're opening a frosting package instead of learning how to make real frosting. And nobody's going to hire you as an executive chef in 10 years if you don't know how to make the frosting. (laughs) <laughs> you got to show people how to make the frosting. It's not opening up a package of frosting. I love it, Chef. And just listening to you talk, it just reminds me of one of the biggest lessons I've learned doing so many of these interviews. And it's become a person of value. Uh, find out what it is you're truly passionate about. Find out what skills really light you up inside and be the best damn whatever that is you can be. And then you become a person of value. And now you have leveraging to you know approach mentors to, to offer them something that you can bring to the table instead of just expecting uh, these people to show you how it's done. So any reflects on that? Yeah, you know, um, mentors, uh, you know, I, I've, al- I've always found myself a mentor. Um, Usually it's typically somebody at work that I look to take on, you know, for me to go under their wing and typically somebody outside of the industry, whether it was an author of some sort, whether I was, you know, looking up to Tony Robbins at one point or Brian Tracy, uh, but then finding the chefs in within the place that I could really gravitate towards. And when I worked at the Greenbrier in West Virginia, uh, the one chef there, Peter Timmons, uh, he came in from Europe and I, um, Every night I went to him and I said, I need a question, chef. And this is before the, this is before I had the internet at home, right? This is the early 90s, mid-90s. I said, I need a, a question, chef. And he – the guy was a whiz on classical uh, classical culinary. So he throws odd stuff out to me which would send me digging in the trenches in the books at night in La Russe Gastronomique or Herring's Dictionary or Le Repertoire or Escoffian. I'd, I'd have to find certain answers to the questions and come back the next day. And he enjoyed asking me the questions and it really got contagious there for a while because some of the other young chef apprentices would gather with me to get the question of the night to come back for the, for, for the next day. And that was really just an, it was a great way to utilize a mentor, somebody who I, I really looked up to. And of course I got a lot of respect from him for that as well. I got to just slam on the brakes real quick, chef, because I just want to put emphasis on this. Uh, when approaching people, to find a mentor, uh, the best way to get them to take an interest in you is for you to take an interest in them and their knowledge. Uh, I mean, it's just like, why does, why do we all love our dogs? Right? Because they love us. So if we (laughs) show our appreciation for the people in our lives that have the knowledge and we are, you know, appreciate their knowledge and we take an interest in what they know, they'll they'll be 10 times more likely to take an interest in us and where we're going in our lives. Do you want to share anything with hundred, a hundred percent, you know, um, there's places that I've worked that I've gone and worked off the clock for free because it it was a point where Mm. I'd have to give to make my station run smoothly. And whether the schedule said you punch in at two o'clock or one o'clock every day, I knew going there at noon, writing my prep list, having sharp knives when I punched in and gathering all of my mise en place was going to make me a successful on that station for that day. And that's what it took. Mm. And not many people have that attitude. So you have to give, Um, you know, the more they see you give, the more they're going to give back and the more you're going to get promotions. And, you know, so you're the first person on their mind because they know that your station is wired, that they don't have to worry about your station at saute, grill, whatever you're working. That's where it's happening at. And, and they can trust you and put you in. You're the first person that's going to promote it. You're the first person that's going to get a raise. You're the first person that they're going to take with you on a field trip somewhere. Um, and in the case of the Greenbrier, I got very lucky and I, the whole winter I cooked with the, with Peter Timmons, the executive sous chef at the time in the bunker at the Greenbrier, which was their underground government relocation facility that was owned and oper- operated by the government. And they took it back in the early nineties. And I got to cook with him side by side all winter long in this bunker because he saw that I was going above and beyond. Awesome. I love it. And it's, 
been like that with every job I've done. I've treated every job that, hey, there's more to it than just punching in at two o'clock and punching out at punching in at two and punching out at ten. It, you know, it, it takes more than luck and it, you don't get lucky unless you show up and create that luck. And that's just what I'm hearing from you. And uh, you're a beautiful example of it. And one thing we like to do here, Chef, is to find out why, uh, why we get into this industry and the right reasons to get into the industry. And it sounds like you, uh, you might have uh, evolved throughout your career. So let's first start with when you first got into the industry, when you knew this was going to be your career and why were you doing it then? That's a great, great point. So You know, I grew up in an Italian family and food is a focal point and going through going through high school waiting tables was a way for me to make serious cash (laughs) every weekend. It was awesome. I loved it. And I also saw, you know, the chefs and I was got got friendly with um, with the chefs. I really didn't make that leap into cooking, though, until I started my first year of college. It was hard for me to focus on the accounting book when I found the cookbook more interesting. Mm. And that's when I said, okay, I think I should change majors. Um, I still have a good accounting uh, mind and I took all those accounting courses, uh, business courses, and then I switched to culinary. And you know, from there on out, it was just history. At 19, I started cooking. And my first place I started cooking was a very small two man show. And there was a 30 room in, so it was 60 diners a night and um the most 60 diners and it was a chef and his assistant i became his assistant he was out sick within six months um of working there he would he, he had the, he was out sick and I, the owner saw what i could do and they're like wow we didn't know that you could really run this kitchen and it was enough there was no big deal the kitchen it wasn't you know a fancy kitchen the food wasn't fantastic but I knew what I, I got my way around that kitchen and they saw that and they appreciate it. So when it was time for the chef to actually leave a year and a half down the road, well, who do you think got promoted to be the chef? I did. Nice, um, nice. So while I'm going to culinary school, I'm also holding a head chef job at a place making some nice money and, uh, and getting great experience. So it was just all of a sudden that's when, you know, that first year of college was when like, yeah, okay, I, I need to switch because I mean, it's it's blatantly in front of me. I like cooking. I yeah. love cooking. Yeah. I love food. And I always wanted to be a good cook because, again, coming from an Italian family, it's totally necessary that you cook family meals. So as early as I was four or five years old, I remember rolling out orchette pasta with my, with my grandmother. And uh, I would love just – helping her in the kitchen, doing whatever, helping her in the garden. We would go to uh, Arthur Avenue in the Bronx, the whole family, and you know, buy all kinds of seafood. And as a four-year, five-year-old, I'm screaming on the streets of Arthur Avenue, isn't anybody going to buy me a crab today? <laughs> crab meaning a lobster. I, so I had a very sophisticated palate um, at a young age, uh, especially back in the 70s. Now sophisticated palates are left and right because of uh, the internet and and food food networking. You got you know these six seven year olds. You know I want sushi. I want Indian. I want Thai. But back then it wasn't like that. There was no big influence besides your immediate family was influencing your in, your your food that 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 you were eating or wanted to eat. Awesome. So. I just want to ex- extract a few things I picked up from listening to you talk. And that first thing is you got to find your lane. Listen to your, you know, your gut. Listen to what your, your that inner voice is telling you. And if that inner voice is telling you to take an interest in the, the, the cooking or whatever it is, get in that lane and then just focus on being, you know, really good at one thing. Don't try to do it all. Just become a person of value and focus. And for you, for, it was food. Uh, and the other thing uh, I really picked up from you is – living intentional. Once you found your lane, you started making choices intentionally to get to the next level. Is that safe to say? A hundred percent. It was a hundred percent. You know, it was like, just live your passion. I mean, now you know that all these guys are saying, if you're not doing what you love now, it's ridiculous because you can make money anywhere. (laughs) Back then, you know, it was, you know, I make more money on my YouTube channel a month than I made back as a 19, 20 year old busting my butt in a kitchen. (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, to, you can make money anywhere. There's no reason to do something that you're miserable with. You can start a business with virtually no money down. You can become an expert by immersing yourself with YouTube content and Google and, 
And within six months, you can be a top expert in any mm. field that doesn't require a specific degree to practice in that state. Um, if you know what I'm getting at, but you can just you can you can be an expert on anything in a short amount of time. Just focus on it and do it. And we all have all this extra time. We all have the same time every day. And the average American watches three hours of TV a day. I think it's your phone is included in that too, man. If you're gonna watch something. I can't stand when people read these love stories and this and that. I'm like, man, read a book that's going to inspire you. Read a book that's going to motivate you. Read a book that's going to get you off your butt and do something. Well, I ran eight marathons back in 2014 from April to November. It was one every month. And when I look back, all the books I read in 2014 um, were on ultra runners and their stories. I must have read a dozen books that year on ultra runners. So that was programming my mind. So I'm listening to a guy running a hundred mile race like Scott Jurek. So for me going out to run 26 miles was nothing. It was just like, yeah, it's second <laughs> nature. And people don't understand, man, you surround yourself with five people that, that are going to make a difference in your life. You know, the five closest people do make a difference in your life, but then program yourself with the books you read. You, you start reading these drama books and these love story books and this and that. You, it's like watching soap operas. You're only going to have more problems. That's what you're focusing on. I got to just, you know, say this is beautiful. I'm loving everything you're sharing with us. And I can't help but think of Fabio uh, Bibiani who came on the show. And uh, he's, you know, he said, I don't do anything in life that doesn't contribute to three things, whether it, it has to make me either happier, healthier, or wealthier. And think about uh, how much time we waste that doesn't contribute to any of those things. That's just dead time. And time is the one thing that make, that it's the equalizer. What we choose to do with that time, no matter how rich we are, no matter how good we had it when we came into this world, we can choose to do certain things in our life to be intentional and just make the most of that time. Do things that make you either happier, wealthier, or healthier. And if you do that, everything kind of falls in place. And then Awesome advice on, you know, you're the average of the five people you spend the most of your time with. So why not choose to ch spend your time with incredible people who have done amazing things? And you can do that by just picking up a book and being influ influenced by these people. And you're, you're just the way you view the world, the lens through which you see the world is going to change and you're going to feel like you're just a loser <laughs> and it's going to motivate you to do incredible things. I love it, chef. Yeah. I, I read every single day awesome. and I don't know if you, I don't know if you know who Ty Lopez is, but he says, man, turn around and grab, grab that mentor right off the bookshelf. You can be in a yeah. room now and have Bill Gates on your bookshelf. You can have Charlie Munger right there. Everybody's right there at your fingertips to give you the advice that you need. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Head over to restaurantunstoppable.com slash books. There's a complete list of every book that's been mentioned on the show. Start there and just start surrounding yourself with amazing people. And, Chef, I want to fast forward because um, it seems like there's a point in your life where your your purpose, your why shifted. And you really started being even more intentional and in doing things with a, a, a purpose, a cause, a, a mission. So talk to us about that time of your life and how oh, yeah. you're better now because of it. So – I was 28 years old. My wife was pregnant with our first uh, child, a daughter, and I was living in Colorado. And I was every job I got, I would always make a joke that was really true. I would gain one pant size because at a certain point, um, well, actually back in culinary school, one of the professors told me, "If you work, you work for the rich," and I really liked that, and it really. It really stuck to me. So at that point, I tried to get jobs at really nice places like the Broadmoor, the Greenbrier. I worked up in uh, in Breckenridge. I went to London. So I was getting all these jobs that we were cooking fantastic food. The food was tasting awesome. The guests were amazing. I worked in a Michelin three-star restaurant. I worked for Pierre Kaufman, who had trained Gordon Ramsay and Marco Pierre White. Wow. But dinner, staff meal – you know, it was like the leftover lamb chops with borsan cheese on a baguette and you eat that at 11 o'clock at night and then you have a creme brulee and you eat all these rich foods, pasta with cream sauces and the weight would pack on me. And at 28 years old, my doctor looked at me and goes, you need cholesterol medication. And I said, no, that's the last thing I want. I didn't know much about health back then, but I know I was already on 
other medications, prescription deodorant. I was on acid reflux medication. My acid reflux was so bad that they wanted to operate on me. I had to Man. sleep sitting up. It was I was miserable. Tums wouldn't work. Now I know that baking soda is a cure all for that, and it works instantly. Um, so high blood pressure, high cholesterol. I was like, wow, asthmatic my whole life. I couldn't run a quarter of a mile to save my life. And now the doctor's saying, you need cholesterol meds. And I said, I don't want them. And he was very firm with me. I said, listen, I don't want to take them. He goes, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 30 days. I need blood in 30 days. I said, I can do this myself, doc. I was living in Colorado and I met Chris, the owner of Boulder Fruit Exchange uh, produce company out there. And Chris once a year would run for fun up Pikes Peak Mountain, 8,000 feet up. He run a marathon, 13 up, 13 back. And I'm like, Chris, a human can't do that. What's your secret? He's like food. And of course he owned an organic local produce distributor. So it's no wonder, you know, that he's preaching food. So I said, okay. So I kind of got, got a little interested in health and people in Colorado were a bit progressive. They'd come in and say, Hey, can you make me a vegan birthday cake? Can you do, and I was like, ah, no, I really can't. So as a young wannabe moving up to the next level chef, I got frustrated that there were certain parts of my career I couldn't answer. And I was embarrassed one time when somebody asked me for something, I didn't know what it was you know, as far as the dietary needs. So I started reading dietary, diet health books, uh, health, health books. So when my doctor said that, I said, Hey, I think I know, I think I can do this. I went back 30 days later, my cholesterol plummeted 65 points. The weight starts coming off. I no longer need acid reflux meds. I, um, my, my, my prescription deodorant was by the wayside. Now my asthma was disappearing, diminishing within 90 days. I was off of every single medication and I was like, wow, this is what health feels like. This is what, you know, but the problem was the stuff I was serving my guests was not the stuff I was eating personally. So it looks weird when you're the chef at a, at a, at a restaurant and you're bringing your own box lunch, right? Because you're not eating the food that's there. So my wife, I remember I brought, I brought tofu home one time and she goes, you're ruining your career. And I said, I'm ruining my career. I'm saving my life. She was all these vegetables and tofu in the house and tempeh and, and I, she was, what are you doing? She was like, you want to be famous? And I said, I, I want to be known, I want to, but I want to be alive. So it took her a little while to jump on the bandwagon of the health foods, but I found myself going to work, cooking foods that were just totally filled with chemicals and high sugar, high fat, uh, and a lot of cream, a lot of butter and that I was serving to our guests, but I wasn't eating myself. So then I, I like I said, our, our, my wife was pregnant, so it was really a major necessity to now say, okay, I've screwed myself up. I don't wanna screw my my kids up. You know, I'm their responsibility. I mean, they're my responsibility now. I gotta, I gotta do something, I gotta take care of them. So that whole thing was happening all at once, and I started touring farms. And you meet farmers that won't eat their own potatoes because they're spraying neurological damaging chemicals on their crops so they can make a living, you, you it's like, what, what am I doing? What, what, what is this? What is this food that we're serving? So I said to the farmer, I said, well, what do you do for potatoes? He goes, I love potatoes. I eat my neighbors. He grows organic. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Like, oh my gosh. So you realize very soon that that 18 wheeler that's sitting outside that hotel every morning, unloading the same size beef tenderloins, the same size pork chops, the same uniform cuts of everything you realize very quickly that our food system is being very manipulated. It's so bad. Yeah. So it was, the writing was on the wall that I needed to work at a place or ultimately own my own place where I was living. I was serving the food that I was actually eating myself. And I, I people, sometimes people hear the word organic or back then they heard the word organic. And the first thing they thought of was like, Oh, you're a healthy habits lunch cafe. I'm only going to get like a whole grain pita with some sprouts and an avocado on it. And we're not talking anything like, Oh, that's good though. You had a nice avocado and fresh, awesome organic tomato in there. You got a meal, but we're talking gourmet real food. Now you're talking food that, and back then it was all about Zagat. You're talking about Zagat rated food. That's 25, 26, 27. That's now getting you, you're using real food for that you're, and you're cutting back on the, 
on the fats and the sugars. I always I look now at chefs that say, oh, I, that they make good food. I'm like, yeah, but you just added a pound of sugar to that. You can add a pound of sugar or a half Butter. a cup of sugar, anything, <laughs> and make it taste good. You can take something that's super bitter like vinegar. Like you wouldn't drink vinegar, but you, if you add a pound of sugar to a gallon of vinegar, it's going to taste good, right? So, <laughs> Chef, I, you're giving us great stuff. You really are, but I want to – hone in on this time where you know you really started uh taking all this information you really started just giving yourself the knowledge and i feel like all of us for the most part if we're given the knowledge and we understand the difference between what's right and what's wrong we will do the right thing and i think you're you are living proof of that and why it's so important to take the time to educate ourselves to just be familiar with what our actions you know how that affects the world and um Dive deeper into like when you really started like just becoming an advocate and sure. living in, intentionally and just being living your brand, living what you believe in, living your core values and how that started changing your life. So the big turning point was understanding that the guest is important, but they're not the only person you have to make happy. They are far from the last person. Uh, gentlemen, uh, the book Fast Food Nation, the gentleman who hung himself. I started working with his stepbrother and buying food in Colorado from their farm. We gathered up 15 chefs. We sat at a table. We gathered 15 farmers. We looked at them and said, hey, we have $5 million worth of purchasing power. What can you guys do for us? The farmer's eyes lit up. It was amazing to see what happens when you now focus on making the supplier happy, the mm. farmer happy. I had far, one farmer call me and told me I, I saved his marriage. Wow. All he wanted to do was grow beans, and his wife wanted him to go back into IT somewhere. Um, Jay Frost from that farm uh, where his brother had hung himself a couple years earlier said to me, Marcus, my farm is now viable. He goes, for the longest time, my kids were to get off the farm, go to college, and never come back to the farm. He goes, because this is, this is a death trap. He goes, but now you've given us hope that my kids are gonna go to college and I want them to come back to the farm and work a farm that's viable. And when that, I mean, it brings tears to my eyes when I still tell that story. When you make the supplier as happy as your guests, you have come full circle in business. And that's when everything starts to really, really happen. It, it's, it's against business law to make one one person happy and abuse the other person to make one person happy. And sure, we still all have to, you know, get bids for certain items. We still have to be a little forceful with our suppliers and our vendors, but we all have to work together and make each other happy. And my one policy with farmers, I never, ever negotiate a price with a farmer. The price is the price. It's my job to now market their product as a superior product and get an extra dollar on the table for it. And that's really where it's at. Man, there's just so much I want to talk about uh, and just highlight. And um, I think you're just a beautiful example of what happens when we start educating ourselves, start, you know, becoming passionate about something and you have a reason, a purpose to live. And you, you see so many restaurant owners open restaurants and it's a concept, an idea, and they have to live that idea. And they, they create this mission, they put it on the wall, the, the core values and blah, blah, blah for the sake of having it. But what's different about what you did is you, these missions, these visions, these, these values were an extension of who you were, what you believed in. It wasn't a concept. It was an extension of what you're, how you're trying to change the world, how you're trying to leave the world a better place than when you came into it. And when, when you open a restaurant and you have that kind of impact, uh, when you live with that kind of mission, it, it makes it possible for you to start with, you had $50,000 and you were able to make it work. Like you, you need that drive. You need that something else to, to, to get you out of bed every day and to to show up for a reason. And before I pass back over to you, that word impact, uh, when you do things for the right reason, because of how you're going to affect other people for the, you know, thinking of others first before yourself. I mean, that's when you create an impact And this industry is all about impacting, creating experience and just changing the lives of other people. Any just thoughts of what I shared? Oh yeah. I mean, it's everything you do should have a purpose and a lot of people disconnect their purpose in life when they get their paycheck. And it's just, it's for me, I'm not about that. I, the reason why when people walk into my restaurant and they, they come back and back and they're raving fans and, and they only trust me for the salmon they eat or the salt they eat or the, the cognac they're drinking is because 
everything has my seal of approval on it because I'm not going to serve you something that I wouldn't personally consume it is, it's, it's, or support. I like to tell people we all work hard for our money. When you hand me your dollar, it's my job to respect that dollar and put that dollar in the right hands. Mm. And going to a multinational conglomerate to buy gin or vodka or scotch or beer isn't the way to protect the value of that dollar. Those companies only go into areas, they buy businesses, they, they take, dismantle the, the, uh, the real estate, the, the, the jobs, and they switch production most likely to their corporate headquarters or their big factories and they saved it happened here in my own hometown it's happened and you see places like rolling rock when budweiser bought them they lost two three hundred jobs in rolling rock in that brewery latrobe's not the same johnny walker diageo bought them 700 people lost their jobs when you're a small community you can't loot you can't afford to do that and that's what these companies do so when you hand me your dollar I'm not giving it to a company that's dismantling a community somewhere. I'm giving it to a, a person who runs a real business, provides real jobs in a real community. And whether it goes from salt to our palm sugar or to the scotch on the bar or the bottle of beer, that dollar is going to go to the best place that I can see possibly fit. And uh, I really love your the way you purchase, and I want you to dive deeper into that. Um, you try to support local whenever possible, but you also have a, a core value of uh, supporting when when you can't buy local and you need an ingredient. Your next step is to support independent. So, really, just break that apart and explain th the impact of that. Sure, farm to table is a massive movement in America. I think it's a, a highly abused term as well. You go to a restaurant, they have five, 10, 15 local ingredients. Uh, of course, you can't run a whole restaurant with all local products. It's pretty hard to do, especially up here in New York, is my lemons, my salt. There's a lot of things you just cannot get. So when you look at the whole piece of the pie, you look at a farm to table, is it 10, is it 8% of all the ingredients are really coming local and they're touting and making this whole big thing? So that's great they're doing that. But then you turn around and buy slave labor chocolate, slave labor sugar. You buy things that are getting farmed in Asia with their unfair labor practices. So if you're going to respect that 5, 10, 8 percent of your products, why not respect the rest? And um, it's all it's research, research, research. It's about buying things that you know – that the money is going to 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 a, a real family, and sure, you know, are we perfect? We're not perfect by any means, but we're always looking to take the next step to find the next product that's better than the one we're already serving. So the more you do that, the better your products get. Mm. And you know, and there's certain products that I'm not that proud of um, because I don't know, you know, 100% of all of the stuff. And like Papadoms, we buy from India. Well, it's being made with peanut oil. I don't know what's being sprayed on that peanut oil. I don't know the company. But you know what? We buy Papadoms because it's a great product that's made from lentil flour and it's gluten-free. And a lot of gluten-free people that come in love them. And when you go to an Indian restaurant, they serve you Papadoms. So, you know, if somebody came up to me tomorrow and said, hey, I have an organic Papadom for you, I'd buy it. And I'd switch from the Papadom that I'm already using. So it's a matter of progressing and taking steps forward each time as well. So what's your argument for that person, for that restaurant owner who's saying, you know, that that business model just isn't realistic. It, I, I need to live. I need to pay my bills. I need to, you know, I mean, that might be good for you, but I'm going to do it this way because I need to, you know, survive. What's your argument for that person? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a vicious cycle. You know, first of all, I'm surviving. I'm paying my bills. Um, you know, I, I don't think I'm hurting at all. The issue is we're, we've come to a point in America where we want to buy cheaper products and corporations get, get greedier and greedier. So they outsource and they really don't raise – they don't drop the prices. I mean I look at all my old running gear from 15 years ago. It's all made in America. You go to the store now to buy the same brand. It's made – and where they're paying seamstresses 55 cents an hour or 18 cents an hour in certain countries rather than Americans at $29 an hour. So, you know, the cycle goes around. You're, we're shipping jobs. We're shipping our money out. We're shipping our resources out. If you're putting money back into the economy, this is why those – those across America, there's Berkshire Bucks. There's a play. There's locally here we have um, um, these these money shares where you pay with lo a local currency that could only be used in your community. 
And this has been very, very successful all across America because you can follow your dollar, your money, go back to the person who's in that money share, money pool as well. And so you have a compromise. You can either buy cheaper products like the corporations are doing. You can ship our jobs over. You can create unemployment. You can create a lack of people to actually purchase the product. So it's a vicious cycle that where do you break the cycle? And you know, if you're a restaurant that wants to break the cycle, don't do it all at once. Take three ingredients, take four ingredients, take 10 ingredients and break the cycle. Instead of buying salt from the Himalayans, Himalayan pink salt or Florida cell, buy salt from America, from the Utah flats, independently owned company. You're providing jobs and quinoa. Don't buy quinoa from, from Ecuador or Bolivia. Buy or from Peru. Buy it from Colorado, from our, our organic quinoa producer out there where they're supplying jobs in America. Um, olive oil. California makes fantastic olive oil. Don't buy Italian olive oil. Buy California olive oil. Stuff like that might be about the same exact price that you're already paying, but you're supporting products that are made in America and you're making a difference. And it's about – all of us taking one, two, three steps at a time instead of jumping and leaping. Um, and a lot, people are going to get frustrated if they – it's like trying to lose weight. Oh, I want to lose 40 pounds. No, no, lose eight pounds. <laughs> Have the reach goal of 40 but focus on the first eight. Yeah. And then uh, and then when, once you get the momentum rolling, then it's easier. Once that, I mean, you know, high tide raises everything. Once momentum goes, momentum's unstoppable. Absolutely. And, you know, it's just it, a book that really dives into that topic of just starting with the little things is the power of habit. And really, it's just the hardest part about doing the right thing, whether it be working out, whether it be making the right decision, is just starting small, creating the habit. Once the habit's in place, then you can start doing a little bit more, a little bit more. But just break, break the cycle, like you say, and start by just making little goals and just slowly grow up like scale yep. over time. And this isn't something I talk a lot about on the show, but if you notice, uh, if you listen a lot, you notice I, I don't hardly ever interview franchises um, unless they're like really small and they're about the franchise. I stay away from franchises and corporations. And I really try to focus on independent restaurant operations that have core values and make decisions, not based for their success, but for the success of the community and for other people. And I just, I love being able to make examples of people like you who can just, you know, influence other people to not get into business, to try to make as much money as possible, but to make the biggest change possible. And when you focus on just giving back and making it about other people, you will find that over time, the more you give, the more you get, and you can do it with a clean conscience and everybody will be better off because of it. And I hope that, you know, when I hit episode 1000, I will have influenced at least five people to, you know get into this business for the right reason and being able to make pe examples of, or an example of people like you, chef, man, just it, it, thank you. It's an honor to be able to make an example of people like you. Awesome. Thank, thank you for appreciating that. I mean, you, you did a lot of work going through all my websites. <laughs> I just asked this great question. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, dude, there's still so much we got to talk about. Um, I, I want to kind of, uh, fast forward into, uh, this book that you recently wrote 50 mistakes. And I, this is, I got super, I started like doing a little dance in my head when I saw that you had this 50 mistakes book, because one question I ask all my guests on the show is what's one time you failed and tell me about that failure. And I've chronicled, I mean, I've, I've categorized, or what's the word I'm looking for. I'm, I'm so excited right now. I can't even talk. I've curated all this advice, all these mistakes. And I'm really curious, uh, if you could just share a few of these mistakes, uh, things that you've noticed people make, uh, these mistakes they make, what would like just the most or the biggest mistakes, the most impactful mistakes be, if you could just narrow it down to like three. So sure. So the biggest mistake is people don't get a database. Your database is your most important asset as a business owner. You know, they, they, they lose the opportunity to capture people's information. So people walk into a restaurant, you will all remember the old goldfish bowl, you drop your business card, you write your birthday down. How many places 10 years ago would you hear back about your birthday? No, nobody ever sent you a birthday offer. Nobody, so they might've been gathering information, but they weren't using the information. I see a lot of restaurants, you go to their website, there's no way for them to sign up for a newsletter, communicate with you. You go into a restaurant, there's no comment card. There's no way for them to grab any information. And if they do, they're still not using it. So database. So if my restaurant were to burn down tomorrow and I had to open up in nine months from now, what am I going to do? I'm going to email my 8,000 people on my list 
if I don't have a list, I'm not mailing eight, eight people. Mm. You have to communicate to people where you're going, what you're doing, what's happening. And when you go to sell your business, when you go to sell your business, how would it be to hand the next business owner and say, oh, by the way, here's uh, 8,000 or 10,000 people in my database that have actually been in my doors and have eaten here? Or how good would it be to say, hey, you know what? I'm taking my database with me. I'm going to open a new restaurant five miles away, and here goes my database with me. They've all been in to know me. So database is the most important asset, the most important thing that you need to learn how to capture and you need to learn how to communicate and work it. Okay. Three things, uh, three ways, the best ways to capture information or emails. Sure. So obviously a comment card right then and there. If people walk into your restaurant, do you know it's five times easier, six times easier to get somebody in for the second time than the first time? People throw all kinds of ridiculous money on ads and they get a one-time customer and they don't communicate to them again or gather their information. Comment card at the end of the meal right there. Boom, bam. What did you like? And we, you, may we use your comments you get a little, you know, check box to box say, hey, you go to a restaurant website, you go to Facebook, and you see comments, they need a name on them. They're much more, there's much more validity when you attach a name. So just make a comment card, say, hey, do you mind if we use your comments for marketing purposes? Yes or no. What did you like the most? What can we improve upon? What's your birthday so we can send you an, a birthday offer? Name, address, email. Get whatever you can from them and uh End of, the, end of the night, the next day, your office person puts them all in the database. There's lots of different programs to do databases now. Um, in my book, I talk about one. I think it's like mistake number 30. There's a specific platform that I love and that I've used for 10 years uh, that I wouldn't change for a thing. Uh, but you put them into something like MailChimp, Constant Contact, uh, Active Campaign, or Infusionsoft if you want to do more sugar-based marketing, much more in-depth lead generation, stuff like that. Your website, that's the next best place to get them. Um, time right. out, time out before we go to the website, uh, just a few things I want to reflect on. Uh, you shared some great resources, like the email platforms you're using, uh, as far as, uh, comment cards, guys, uh, hum system has been mentioned a few times on the show. And that is like a, a modern day way to collect comments. And it's, I'm not going to get into detail. Uh, I'll link to the episode where we talk more about it. Uh, but check that out. And you had mentioned, uh, I think you were talking about royalty, uh, Royalty rewards. Yeah, is that the one that you said that you would that yeah, you yeah? That's in the book. Yep, love them. Uh, do you want to dive a little bit more into sure. that and why it's great? Sure. Yeah. So royalty rewards. Um, uh, it's a system that 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 was built by by restaurateurs for restaurateurs, and it's always being improved. And the neat thing about this is it's a system that relies upon snail mail just as much as email. In fact, more snail mail. There, people get so overloaded with email nowadays, it's being abused. Marketers ruin everything, right? We've ruined email marketing. You used to have 50, 60% open rates. Now we're lucky for like 6% open rate, right? <laughs> like, you, who I got 10% open rate. Yeah, it's a good, good investment, a great email. You send somebody a six by nine color postcard personalized to them in their mailbox, you get a 100% oh, open rate. They're gonna touch it, right? It's, oh, it's a postcard. That's a much, much better rate. When, Plus, when people hold something physically, one of the best wine shops I know, when you walk in, the owner talks to you and he hands you the bottle of wine they're talking about. Because once you have something in your hand, it's hard to put back. We like things we can take possession of. When you send them a birthday postcard, an offer, an anniversary offer, an award certificate, and they're holding it in their hand, it's much more valuable than that what's sitting in their email box virtually. Awesome. So it's a balance of snail mail and emails and royalty rewards is a big focus on snail mail. Snail mail is so old that it's actually working again. You know, it's so true. And I just recently developed a new habit of writing thank you letters to my past guests. So you'll be getting one. But what we're coming to a place in society where everything's so diluted that everything, like all the things you do on, if it's digital, it's just, it just means shit. It doesn't mean anything anymore. There's no impact there. So when you take the time to sit down and write something out, you're going to be remembered and you're going to have a bigger impact with people. And that today, today it's content marketing and writing, writing a letter to somebody and thanking somebody or sending something in the mail, like that makes an impact. And it's about standing out and being the person that's willing to do the things to show that you care that, yep. I mean, it's, like we're we're going back in time. Uh, it's kind of crazy to think, but it's happening. And Some um, things never come back, but certain things yeah. 
you, there, certain things are there for a reason. So I like how you said thank you cards. You're going to write a thank you card. Yeah, you're getting one, man. Look out. And, George, uh, <laughs> George W. Bush uh, Sr., George, George Bush Sr., he uh, he was he wrote thank you cards every single day, handwritten notes. And we do that with our guests. I require my staff every night. You have their information. Either they're in our program already or they just fill out a comment card. We have postcards here, handwritten notes, something personalized. Glad you enjoyed your steak tonight. Uh, glad you enjoyed that bottle of wine. It's my personal favorite too. Handwritten, send out. We do it every single night. Super, super powerful. Thank, handwritten thank you cards. It's something that, you know, something from the past, but hey, it, it's so impactful. Yeah. It's like sending somebody a birthday card a month late, right? <laughs> it's good. It, it's going to catch somebody's attention. It might even spark a phone call like, hey, it's not my birthday. Yeah, but you got your birthday card. I know you got it now, right? Yeah. So it's going to spark conversation. I love it. And uh, you're about to move on to websites, and we're still talking about – sorry, this is my fault. I love to get off track. And, uh, I do just, too. Just to summarize, we're talking about the biggest mistake right now. People don't collect data, and the best way to get that data is through – uh, your email, get, collecting yes. emails. And now we were just listed a few ways you can get those emails. There's a ton of ways. I mean, I should probably do a whole episode on how you can collect emails, but you were about to talk about websites and uh, website. Yeah. Have a pop-up box, have a pop-up box, have a call to off, have a call to action offer, like save 10 bucks on your next purchase of 50, uh, free dessert, free appetizer, a half price beer or something. Um, Put that on your website. Have a call to action. Go to my website. It pops up. Save ten bucks off your next your next time visiting with us, Chef Marcus. <laughs> and without going into detail, just list like one or two tools or or places we can go. I, places I can link back to in the show notes for people to learn more about how to create a pop up on their website. So I use Active Campaign. Um, is that what you're looking for? Names of programs? Yeah. Just, I, I mean, yeah. we don't need to go into detail, but I just want something you know something people can go to the show notes for and you know take the initiative Active to learn campaign. more. Uh, Sumo, Sumo is really good. I haven't personally used them. I know some people that use them, but more and more, I've told Constant Contact 50 times. I don't use them anymore. You have to create a pop-up box to capture um, to capture emails. But they all these all these email management companies, database management companies, have some kind of HTML box that you can encode on your website. It might not pop up and be predominant, but you can place it in a predominant area. Mm. So do that. Um, one of my next favorite tactics to get emails or get database, when you go to a fair or food show, when you're out doing a, a street fair and you're setting up a booth and giving stuff away, you put a big sign out, win a free, win a hundred dollar gift card and you have a drop box right then and there. I consulted a restaurant a few years, two years ago. Um, we did it at a street fair. They had almost a thousand people in their database before they even opened the doors. Wow. Because they did this six weeks before they were scheduled to open and they gave out free mozzarella cheese. Hand the guy had they did the guy making hand mozzarella right out there on the street, created a show. They had a, almost a thousand emails. Guess how busy their opening was, their official grand opening. They had three <laughs> full turns. Wow. That's awesome. Man, it's incredible. Uh this is great stuff. So Real quick, I just want to put a break in here. Um, how are you doing on time? Because I have a feeling this is going to go long, but you're just giving us gold, and I want to respect your time. But if you can go to like a little bit longer, I, I'm willing to let you just you know keep no on problem. doing what you're doing. Yeah, let's just keep going. All right, awesome. So before we move on to the next big mistake that people make, um, I want to give a shout out to Nick Fosberg. He was on the show. I'll link to this episode. Uh, he authored uh, Bar Restaurant Success. Uh, if you use the links in the show notes that I'll have, he gives the book away for free, guys. And he talks about all this stuff, how to use modern day platforms to uh, write copy, to integrate your email with your website, with your, uh, I mean, I can't remember the, the term, uh, but he basically just gives you a guide on how to set this stuff up, how to promote your restaurant using modern day technology. And uh, he, th that bar restaurant success is a great resource. If you guys want to go there to learn more too. So the second, does he own a restaurant too, or a bar? He owned a couple uh, bars and now his big thing is just helping other people learn what he learned. He became a marketing promotion guru and now he's just spreading what he learned. He just started a podcast too. Um, the breakthrough podcast, a breakthrough bar podcast. Again, I'll link to it in the show notes. I love cool. sharing resources, but, uh, okay. The, the second biggest mistake, uh, we'll try to be better about getting through this without getting too sidetracked. <laughs> okay. So the second biggest mistake, you know, employee management, <laughs> employee management. It is so employees are so difficult to recruit and, and, and keep going. And you have to view yourself as a coach 
a mentor and a babysitter is the bottom line. And if you're not communicating to your staff on a regular basis, meetings, workshops, seminars, field trips, Facebook group posts, uh, emails, um, text communications, it's all about training your staff, training, training, training. And I know so many businesses say, oh, you can't train staff. No, you have to train staff. You have to train them sometimes a hundred times. You have to do a lot of role playing. And people just don't have the means set up to say, well, I just too much to set up a a, um, a handbook or a, a training log. Well, if, if you have a meeting once a week, if you have a meeting once a week and record, do a video recording of the topic you're doing in 52 weeks, you're going to have 52 10 to 20 minute videos that you can train all new staff with. You put it on a website, you put it on a YouTube channel, you have a company like Active Campaign or Infusionsoft, which can set up a whole series of, of emails that are trigger based. An employee opens one email, the welcome email, first email, they open it, the next day they get the second email. They go on to type form and fill out a little tiny quiz based upon that. Then they prompt them to get the next email. Or you can do weight trainer and pay like $1,000. Uh, there's a lot of programs that will do it for you. Um, if you're a little bit tech savvy, you can do it yourself. But the bottom line is you need to make a video. You need to create content of something to keep your staff. Every single week we're creating some kind of content for staff training. If I do it in person, they're also going to get an email to them virtually. So if they missed it, they can watch it at home. If they want to touch up on it, they can do it again. And so there's no – Again, it's about taking one or two steps forward. It's not about sitting down and writing a whole manual front to back in the beginning. I like to go to restaurantowner.com. Mm. He does, he does a great job. He has tons and thousands of templates. If you want a template on a cell phone and policy for your employees, chances are he has that. A, a policy for sexual harassment. He has that already there. You put your logo on it, you read through it, make a couple changes, and you have everybody sign it on your <laughs> Uh, on, your, on your on your staff. So now once you create a new policy, like a cell phone policy, that now goes into the official big binder that they get when they when they first check in and get their get their work. So it's this is a work in progress. It's not something that you created overnight. Rome was not built overnight. I wasn't working for free at these restaurants and and volunteering doing stuff. I, it, to, to be better that next day, it was it was a whole foundation process of building, building upon building, and it's never too late to build a foundation or make a foundation bigger. Just keep going. Yeah. So, one of the most valuable things that that I can ever tell anybody about training their staff is quiz them, quiz, quiz, quiz. Valentine's Day was the other day. My wait staff knows what's what's in our white bean dip that they serve with the bread, but I went to every single bus person. I said, "Tell me what's in the white bean dip." Tell me what's in the bread. Valentine's Day, you have a lot of new people in your restaurant that don't know the bread you serve. They don't know the white bean dip. In our case, we serve white bean dip. So, hey, here's our whole wheat organic mish bread from Bread Alone with our homemade organic white bean dip. Oh. You know, I say, oh, what's in the bean dip? So I quiz everybody. Everybody passed the quiz because I've quizzed them before on it. You say stuff like, you know, like, hey, um, is all of our beef grass fed here? Just throw questions at them. And that's the most important thing. Keep it on your toes. Now, the more questions they can answer, you lay off the quizzes. And whether it's a verbal quiz or a pop quiz, we do pop quizzes every day, five simple questions. But you want to quiz the people who need the quizzing. You still quiz everybody. When I say lay off, don't quiz a person who knows everything. Quiz somebody who needs to learn something. I love keep- it. Those. This is gold you're dropping on us right now. I, I mean, I don't know if you can see my video right now, Chef, but I'm like dancing back and forth. And I'm like, I'm like chomping at the bit right now just to chime in. And uh, there's a couple things I just want to share to kind of compound off of what you just said. Uh, the reason why this podcast now doesn't focus on the restaurant, but it focuses on the people behind the restaurant is that your restaurant will only ever be as good as you are. And it's up to you to give your people the tools, the resources, the knowledge the systems, the processes, the procedures to be the best they can. And it takes des- a lot of discipline. I got to give a, a shout out to our girl, Shyla Morris, who recommended you. And I'm so happy she did. Sure. I'm going to send her the five thank you cards. Um, she <laughs> said, uh, you know, you can go the rest of your life working. I think it was like 16 hour days, or you can go a few weeks working 18 hour days, and then you'll be able to go to working five hour days. And, you know, the, the thing is, 
like hopefully you guys want to be in your restaurant more than five hours a day. But the whole idea is it, it takes time and it's going to be a lot of work. But if you show up and you just do a little bit more than you would do when you want to throw on the towel and go home, and go to bed, just stay another hour, work on something. And over time, you will be able to slowly create a, or you'll be able to slowly move yourself out of the restaurant, but not necessarily move yourself out of the restaurant, but do the things that you loved in the first place. Give yourself that freedom. Um, so Shyla, shout out to you. Uh, Got to give a shout out to my two of my sponsors, both my sponsors, restaurantowner.com, which you already mentioned. If you guys go to the show notes, you find the link. If you use that link, you will get 10 days for free or sorry, 10 days for one dollar. It's worth it. Get in there. Get all you can. Even if you don't decide to continue, which you should, it's totally worth it. And please use my links because if my sponsors see that I'm helping them out, they're going to continue to help me out and we can continue to create, create great content together. Uh, and then lastly, Tipsy, you're talking about video. Tipsy is a resource that has created all the videos and the basics on everything you need to know from wine service to knowledge on beer to service on our table service leaderships like all this stuff anything you can think of they created a video from experts in the industry and i'm telling you right now uh if you just go through those videos you can create a curriculum and then test your people on the videos they watch and it's all there for you you don't have to create it and it's ten dollars or twenty nine dollars a month i mean come on like why are you taking advantage of these tools i'm um, sorry i went on a rant there but i just love oh, it when i can oh. share these resources with people and uh you know thank you to my sponsors one more time tipsy and restaurant yeah. how about how about uh jim Rowe? because he told me about you remember jim yeah jim he's awesome uh out there yeah in Seattle. him and i were him and I were, yep, him and I were talking about you yesterday. Oh, boy. I hope you said good things. I'm, I'm going to see him uh, <laughs> next week in Palm Springs. So, yeah. Awesome. Tell him I said hi. I got to send I him sure. a thank you letter, too. Um, <laughs> all right. I, we're at 57 minutes, Jeff. Are you sure you're doing good on time? I want to respect let's, your time. Let's rock it out. Let's keep going. Yes, sir. All right. The third failure. I want three failures, and then we're going to move on to the speed round. All right. Third failure. So this one's got to, you know, there's so many failures. Um, wow. Where, where, where do we go next? I got to fit one more good one in. Let's see. Delegate and empower your staff. I'm kind of fit two in there and one. Um, you have to, us restaurant owners, like Shiloh was saying, working 18 hours. That's the reality. But when you delegate, you can work less and it's finding people. We talked about training staff. Now you're going to delegate and you're not going to be a control freak. A lot of us restaurant owners and chefs are control freaks. And I know a lot of fantastic cooks that are never going to get to the next level because they can't tell other people. They can't get other people to work for them because either they don't, they're nasty or they, they're afraid to delegate. They're afraid to ask people to do something. And you've got to – you can't do this all yourself. You've got to delegate. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have to empower your staff. Well, I have a policy here. Every single wait staff on my staff – on an in hand here – my restaurant has the power to comp up to $50 off a ticket wow. with no questions asked. If a customer is something wrong, you have 50 bucks to do as you please. I will not question. If it's over 50, I need to know. But awesome. we've had to do that once. We've comped 65 bucks once because the ticket got lost in the kitchen and the whole table sat there for two people and it was a $65 bill. And they shoot the wait staff shows, I just comped the whole thing. So you did the right thing. But she's done the comps before and she knows it. But if you don't trust your staff and delegate and empower them, you you have to do everything yourself. And that's 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 so stupid. Mm -hmm. You have to save time for your family, for your kids, for your hobbies, um, to make your to make to read, to run, to exercise, yes. to be fit. You have to save energy for other things. And I know restaurant owners just roll right into work and bust their butt all day and then just roll right back in. I can tell you, I'm here at work early too. I was up at 4.45 today. I was rocking it out. I got a lot of content to publish, a lot of videos to publish. I was on Good Morning America the other day. I'm updating my website. I have a virtual assistant who does stuff for me. I have an office person. I have two office people who do stuff for me. But man, I'm here leading the charge. But guess what? When we're off this phone call, I'm going to go run six miles and take the rest of the day off and go to my <laughs> basketball game. Awesome. And the it's going to open at five o'clock. People are going to come in here, listen to jazz. And my wait staff is going to have everything under control. Beautiful stuff, chef. This has been great. Um, we're going to take a quick break to thank our sponsor, uh, to catch a breath and to just relax, let our, our, our heart rate go down a little bit. And then we'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> 
After studying over 300 successful restaurant professionals, I've discovered that to be successful in the restaurant industry, you need skills that go far beyond knowing how to cook. All of our guest mentors are damn near experts on business operations, systems, and culture. That is not a coincidence. That is what it takes to be successful. This is exactly why I tell everyone I know who wants to open a restaurant or is in the restaurant business to get a membership to restaurantowner.com. For only $29 a month, you have access to over 300 templates, including business plans, checklists, forms, manuals, and procedures. In addition, you have countless resources at your fingertips to join a community that has helped over 40,000 restaurant owners make better lives for themselves. Head over to restaurantowner.com slash unstoppable and because you are restaurants unstoppable listeners you will get the first 10 days for only one dollar again that's restaurantsowner.com slash unstoppable whether you're just getting started in the restaurant business or if you're a seasoned veteran there's always something new to learn that never ends (laughs) But what hasn't changed is the time you get to learn. Tipsy has taken everything you need to know and put it in one easy to access location. With Tipsy, you can learn what you want, when you want, by accessing an incredible library of video courses on topics like food and beverage, service, marketing, and business operations. It's basically a one-stop shop for everything you need to run a successful restaurant. You can also use Tipsy as a staff training tool. Through the management platform, you can select the courses that matter to you and schedule them out to your employees in a few simple clicks. Individual memberships are only $9 a month, and as a restaurant unstoppable listener, you receive an extra 50% off your first month. So what are you waiting for? For $4.50, you can have access to this incredible resource right now. Just find the tipsy banner in the show notes. We're back. The first question I have for you, Chef Marcus, what is your it factor? A habit, a trait, a characteristic, something you believe most contributes to your success. Okay, I pay attention to details. It's all about the details. Like it snows outside here, I want the cleanest sidewalk. I will spend the extra time and money to make sure that my sidewalk has no bank embankment of snow. You look down the whole street, uh, and I'm proud. You walk into my restaurant, I want the best stock bar. You look at my salt, I want the best salt. I'm, I'm so tuned in to the details, and it drives me crazy because not many people are detail orientated. You know, thing goes, I always say to my staff, you stock stuff, it's GSL, grocery store look. I want to look, go downstairs, I want to see everything lined up, nice and neat, like I was walking in a grocery store. I don't want things with boxes ripped off, you cut the box top off. I want to. <laughs> Look in the box and see when that case of wine's empty, not have to open the box. I want to walk by and look. It's all about details that so many people overlook. Drives me crazy. People expect the expected. Yes. It's, it's in the details where the unexpected lives, and that's how you'll be rememberable, and it makes just everything better. That's all I'm going to say. What is your biggest weakness? Biggest weakness? <laughs> I, I'm a great starter. I'm not a good finisher. I'll start a project, I'll have a million dollar idea, and I'll start another million dollar idea before I have made 10 bucks on the first million dollar idea. I need, I need, I know I need to surround myself with people who are good finishers. Mm. So I can start, I can brainstorm, I, 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 I can really come up with the ideas and, and, and implement, but I just need somebody to help me finish. Awesome. Uh, what is one piece of advice you have for leading others? Okay, that's a good one. You know, a lot of different theories on this, and I, I, I kind of do a couple different things. I manage by wandering around. Um, I obviously tell people on my staff that, hey, I shouldn't have to do this because I'm hiring you to do it, but then your staff likes to see you do it, right? So you can't be afraid to work and afraid to do something. Last night, the grease trap started overflowing. I jumped right in. You know, I got my, my sports coat on. I jumped right in. I told the guy what needed to be done. I unscrewed the one. It was something so simple to do and it didn't cause a mess. But if I wasn't here or if I didn't go down there, he would have never followed up on it. So, hey, let's go do this together. I know what exactly he's been. I'll teach you how to do it. So it's about being a good teacher, a good listener. Um, I tell my staff, training is ongoing. 
I, I'm going to critique you every night that you're here because I want you to be a better server. I want you to be a better, understand the guests better. I want us all to make more money. So I kind of employ a lot of things. I like wa- managing by wandering around, just pop in on people, see what they're doing, you know, just check it out. And I'm not afraid to bartend. And I, if we're short in the kitchen, I'll jump in the kitchen and put a chef coat on. Awesome. What is one question you have or thing you look for when you're interviewing, which you probably don't do anymore. Maybe you do, but when you were interviewing. <laughs> it is so hard to get people to interview. It's just amazing. The, the workforce and it's all like that here in New York. It's just so bad. Um, you know, I like to, when I interview people, cause people can put anything on their resume, right? I think, Oh, this, 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 I like to drill them and really question them. So, Oh, I worked at uh, John's taco shop. Oh, okay. Bill, what did you do at John's taco shop? Well, I made the chili, uh, the taco meat. Okay. How much chili did you make a day? Well, I made, um, um, well, he should have noticed that he makes 40 or 50 pounds a day, right? Mm-hmm. So you just peel off the layers and layers as you interview, you, as you interview somebody. And I make it an extreme point to say them. I always ask, how much do you need to work here? What do you need? Because I, if somebody needs 20 bucks an hour and I only have a $12 budget, why hire the person? They're going to look for another job. But if they say, hey, I need thirteen fifty, and I say, well, my budget's 12, I'll tell you what. I'll give you what you want, but you have to give me what I want. Here's a job description. We go over it. I'm going to sit down in two weeks with you. I'm going to go over the job description again, and then every 30 days, I'm going to go over this job description again with you. And if you keep up your deal, I'll keep up my deal. I said it's not worth it for me to argue over 50 cents right now. Because it's only going to make you feel bad that I gypped you, and I'm not going to. I don't want you to gyp me, and I'm not going to gyp you. Is what I tell them. It's, awesome. a, it's, it's this. This is a this is a a totally bilateral agreement where we both get what we want here. That's great advice. And what is a current challenge, uh, and how are you dealing with that current challenge? Current challenge right now is let's see. Well, you know, it's middle of the winter. <laughs> Driving drumming up business is 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 you know there's just not people in my area right now. It's we're very seasonal and we're holding our own, but it's the challenge is every day, market, 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 market. And that's one of the that's one of the top mistakes too. People don't see themselves as marketers. You are a marketer before a chef, before a restaurant owner, before a bartender, before a manager, whatever you do, you are a marketer. Market, market, market. So for me it's it's how can I what else can I increase as far as as far as what kind of Facebook interaction can I get? I'm very into analytics and numbers. So if my my Facebook reach drops ten percent one week, I'm like, man. And then some in wintertime like this, I can't I can't afford that. I have to keep that reach up. I gotta keep getting out there, whether it's a paid ad or whether it's um, organic reaches. So winter winter is a big time for marketing for me. Awesome. And I gotta find out a new word other than awesome. I realize when I record I say it. Way too much. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I, we're awesome too. <laughs> uh, what is one thing besides food your restaurant does really well that separates you from other restaurants? So we have a touring service that we uh, take people to uh, wineries, breweries, distilleries, farms, the 15 passenger van that I bought last year. And, you know, anybody can hire a limo driver and they can drop you off at a winery. We're on the wine trail in uh, the Hudson Valley. There's 20, 30 wineries within a a half an hour to an hour and a half from us. And the last group that I took, five ladies, six ladies, I I go in the tastings with everybody. I serve lunch. Limo driver doesn't serve lunch. I bring a lunch. I roll it out for them. You walk in my van. I'm handing you water. I'm picking up garbage after you. I give you a cheese platter, hummus. it's, It's the full deal. I went into a tasting room with the ladies like I always do. The ladies in there had a great experience at the vineyard before. This vineyard had a new person in the tasting room. She didn't know the wines. She didn't know the history. I took the tasting over because <laughs> <laughs> I know the wine. I buy from the winery. You're going to places that I endorse. Mm-hmm. And when we got back in the van, they were like, thank goodness you were there. We would we would have not. I mean, you, she was told. I was like, I know. I said, that's why you hired me because I know everybody here. I This would go going places that I do business with. And of course, they come back to my restaurant and have a good time and it's that. But you know, it's it's 
you're going with a chef who buys from these businesses, from these farms, from these breweries, which is a huge advantage. And people love this. I mean, winery tours, brewery tours, all these things are huge now. They're really getting bigger and bigger. And I saw an opportunity being so close to the wine trail. But if you're not near a wine trail, there's farms by you. There's breweries. There's distilleries. There's something that you can be taking people. And I use it for catering as well. So it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't just to buy for, for touring and catering as well. Awesome. I just did it again. See that? Man, I got to figure out a new word. Oh, <laughs> what is one book you can recommend that will make us a better person and restaurant owner? Oh, wow. Okay. So love Chet Holmes. Chet Holmes, um, ultimate sales machine. He will really um, do a number on your, on your business practices. As far as a better person, Man, there's so many good books out there. I'm really into Grant Cardone lately. Grant Cardone is really awesome. His 10X book. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. You know, most powerful thing, just writing down your goals every day, twice a day, reaching big, doing a big reach goal. And to get one to get to get one dollar, you gotta shoot for ten dollars. It's just about overachieving. Yeah. It's a great book, and the concept is so straightforward. Whatever you think it's gonna take multiply it by 10 and that's really what it's going to take to be super successful uh so straightforward and so impactful and i just checked both of these books are available on audible head over to audibletrial.com slash unstoppable to get your free book today what is one piece of technology you've adopted in your restaurant uh and how is it influencing operations why are you better because of it oh it's a phone it's a cell phone 100 <laughs> percent. you know when we walk out of the building at night or when my staff walks out of the building at night, that phone gets forwarded to my wife's cell phone. 8.30 in the morning, somebody calls to make a reservation. Hey, my cash register is not that full to answer the phone at 8.30 in the morning from home or wherever I'm at. Um, people like to be, people want instant gratification. And when nobody answers the phone, they're hesitant to leave a reservation, make a reservation. They'll call another restaurant. That The cell phone has revolutionized the picture taking, uh, communicating, Instagram. It's, I mean, it's just that cell phone is so powerful that, you know, I, I don't, it looks like I'm, it looks when you see me, I'm on my phone. I'm not, it's not personal. It's, I'm promoting. I'm out there promoting. I'm talking about my business. I'm hyping it up. I'm out there answering the phone when, 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 when I'll eat eating lunch at another restaurant. I'm answering my phone, taking <laughs> reservations. Well, I'm eating lunch next door. I'm curious. Uh, is there a specific tool you're using uh, to forward these calls? Uh, nope. The phone, uh, star seven, two, star seven, two forwards, uh, with Verizon here and star seven, three unforwards. Awesome. So forward to any phone you want, Great. dial the phone number, make it ring, make an answer with all the knowledge you have. Now, if you could go back in time and give the past version of yourself, one piece of business advice, what would it be? Start with more money. <laughs> <laughs> I started with $50,000. I guess it's a blessing in disguise because I learned how to do it the hard way. I learned how to appreciate it. It was all my own money. Um, I didn't have a partner. It was just my wife and I. And now I have, you know, $45,000 worth of wine and beer sitting in the building and little spirits. Uh, so I've come a long way from that initial investment of $50,000. Uh, so, you know, start slow, build it up. Or do you just, I, I have friends that, you know, borrow that million bucks and just do it right to begin with, you know. I, I don't know the right answer for that, but it would have been nice to have a little more money in the beginning. You no, know, I think part of that issue is, um, I mean, people who get into this industry are dreamers. They have big visions and we, we take big risks. And I think, uh, we go, we shoot for the stars out of the gates, you know, and we, we try to get that a hundred seat restaurant. Uh, we try to do all these incredible things, but, uh, you don't have to start where your vision is. You know, you can start with just, you know, getting the ball going and scale up and then have that vision, work towards that vision, but start where you can start with a minimal viable yep. product. Uh, Eric Reese, yep. lean startup, great book to read to, to teach you how to scale up over time. Uh, don't put yourself in that position where it's going to be Mark too much. Cuban for you to manage. Too. Yeah, Mark absolutely. Cuban's book. Start small. Don't take big loans, start small and keep just building and building. Great stuff. What's one question I could have asked you chef that would have provided more value to this interview. Wow. One question. Oh man. Um, that's a really good one. I mean, you got a lot of good questions. Thank you. We covered a lot of, we covered a lot of awesome things. You know, I'm all about helping people. I, I didn't get, I didn't get where I am just because, um, uh, I did it all myself. I did it because of other people. 
So it's just, it's so important to leverage people, uh, to use people properly, um, copy, copy people. I mean, it's, it, it's been done forever. You copy, you put your twist on and you give credit where credit's due. People come in and say, oh, I love that blue cheese pizza, this and that. Where'd you get the idea? Mario Batali, I say, you know, <laughs> it, it's true. I saw what he was doing. It's great. I copied it. Yeah, it, uh, man. I was just recently uh, reading Napoleon Hill's uh, Think and Grow Rich to do with the previous episode. And in that uh, in that uh, book, chapter 10 talks about masterminds and he talks about the different forms of knowledge. And what you're talking about right there is just uh, I think he calls it compounded knowledge or knowledge yeah. that came before you. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Start with where people ended and take it to the next level. Uh, it's just, you know, you need those ideas. You need a place to start. Uh, awesome stuff. And it's a good thing you said mastermind, because I, I had to tell you, mastermind is so crucial. <laughs> I belong to a mastermind group for 10 years. That's how I know Shyla. That's how I know Jim Rowe. Um, that's how I'm involved in royalty rewards. Um, so yeah, that's the one question right there. Mastermind surround yourself with people that are going to, that you're going to be able to give to and sort of that you're going to be able to take knowledge from, um, you can easily be an official, an official mastermind group. It's good to have friends and acquaintances that you can throw ideas around, but when you lock yourself in a conference room for eight to 12 hours and do nothing but share ideas, hire motivational speakers, have contests, uh, talk about books and, and to have a specific agenda, that's when true masterminding is at its best. Uh, just real quick, tell the folks at home that I didn't prompt you to say that because I just posted my, I just posted an episode yesterday or this morning actually, as we're recording, it was this morning. This will be live on Monday, but it was on masterminds, and I'm starting a mastermind. But the third or the second round, I'm hosting four or sorry, three masterminds of four. There's still four spots open. If there's still four, maybe there won't be after this episode goes live, but. If, if, if it's too late, um, just start your own. Pick up Think and Grow Rich. That, it's a great place to start to learn how to do it. And it's all over the internet on how to start a mastermind. It will change your life. And you're the only person stopping yourself from making it happen. Yeah, masterminds are so crucial. So is your mastermind going to be virtual or do you meet in person a couple times a year? How does How, how is it set up? Well, people are all over the world uh, that are going to be part of this mastermind. So it's virtual and uh, we just host it. And uh, it's twice a month for two hours, four people. So each person gets one hour in the hot seat. And uh, yeah, any advice? Awesome. Cool. Awesome. That sounds great. Awesome. Well, see, now I got you saying it. Now I'm saying it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, just let the, actually real quick, uh, call somebody out. That's how I met you. Shyla hooked me up with you and I'm glad she did. So who is one person uh, who you think could provide value as a guest mentor like you did for us today? All right. So, yeah. Let's see here. Um, who can you call up that I know that would be totally into this? Um I was going to say, um, I was going to pick someone from my mastermind group. Cause there's so many great people in my mastermind group, you know, um, Scott Stanley from Stanley's ale, uh, ale house in Illinois. Um, Christian Christensen out of, out of, uh, out of, um, Canada. He's in the process of redoing his whole place. Really good business sense on really knowledgeable. He really really knowledgeable guy. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, to to go down my Rolodex and, and give, give you some leads. Oh, that'd be amazing. Uh, you said Scott and Christian. Uh, Christian Christensen oh. and uh, a guy by the name of Scott Stanley. Scott Stanley's out of Illinois. Stanley's Ale House. Scott, you know, but sorry, go ahead. You, you know what? I, there's a there's another guy that 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 <laughs> revolutionizes business and. Um, South Carolina. Um, but the thing was for him, he really didn't do it himself. He hired people and surrounded himself in a mastermind and hired the right people on his staff and consultants. And he took his business from 600,000 to like 1.8 million in a matter of like wow. two and a half years. I should hook you up with him because that's All a right. whole thing. I won't stop you. <laughs> it's about um, – it's about him just hiring the right people. You can't do everything yourself. I was talking about delegating before. Well, he just did it. He just got the right people on his team. No, got it, the right person <laughs> with marketing. <We're> and so, <laughs> he, you ask him how he did it, and he's like, I got to call what's-his-name and find out. 
You know, I, I know we're at like the end of our time, but I got to just keep going because I've, I've come to a realization and it's that if I ever open a restaurant, I mean, I've, I've talked to so many incredible, talented people. I've come to accept that if I'm ever successful in this industry, it's going to be because I've developed a team of people that are just blow me out of the water. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, that's what really what it comes down to. Your goal as a restaurant owner should be the least intelligent, the the least talented, the you should be inspired, you know, inspired by all the people you surround yourself with. Uh, it's going to it's not going to be easy to do. But if you can do that, you will be unstoppable. Uh, what do you think about what I just shared? Yeah. Surround yourself. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, get people. Get people that get people that, that that are that much better than you. I have a friend who owns forty restaurants, wow. and um, I love sitting down and having dinner with him. I got to tell you, he has some awesome restaurants in New York City. He's in London. He's in Chicago. He's in Miami. It, it's amazing what this guy. He he said I showed him my book. I gave him a copy of my book, and he goes, "Oh my gosh, you should have interviewed me. I would have given you 150 mistakes I've made." <laughs> I love it, man. That is so cool. Um, Chef, it's been an honor. Uh, this is where we give the folks at home uh, the information if they want to connect with you, if you want to share any more resources on things you've done. Now's the time. How can we connect? Sure. So, um, you know, my, my biggest, latest accomplishment was that book, 50mistakes.com, 50, mista- 50 mistakes business owners make. So, this website's 50mistakes.com. I have maybe 100, 150 videos on there. Questions you ask me today, I just talk about the mistakes, and they're, some of them are three to five minute videos. They're nice and short. Lately, I've been posting some much more, uh, much longer videos up there, just because I have a lot of content to say on a lot of these topics. Um, so that's really cool. You mentioned earlier food fraud, my food fraud website. I'm just, I was tired of of chefs, no matter if they're national celebrity chefs that have their own TV shows, misleading customers about what's on their menu. And the guy down the street who was misleading people on their menu. As a customer, as a guest, they have a right to know what's in their food. You need to be transparent on that. And, you know, and I, I call out some really big chefs on there to set an example that, hey, to the average consumer, you just can't trust a restaurant that you walk into. And that, for me, I don't want to have colleagues like that. I cannot stand that. I want us all to be reputable. Uh, we're all in this together. Let's make the name for ourselves as a, as a reputable business. So uh, foodfraudtv.com uh, is a bit controversial for some people, but very eye-opening. Um, the media loves that website. I get a lot of media hits on there. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, what else? Um, you know, on my, my main website, aromatimebistro.com, time like the herb, T-H-Y-M-E, will have a lot of stuff. My main website from is chefonamission.com, which you'll find every single website I have. I have like 30 different websites. Some of them are just small little websites here and there that don't even pertain to restaurants. If you go to chefonamission.com, you'll see my YouTube channel. I get about 300 to 350,000 monthly views on YouTube where I talk about stuff like this and I talk about health. I mean, if you're a business owner, if you're a high level business owner, you have to really take your health into concern. There's nothing worse than being a millionaire that can't get out of bed, right? You got to be able to smell the roses and make the money. And I preach a lot about health and I'm not going to expect you to go run a marathon, but I'm going to say, Hey, if you can eat better food and you can walk a mile today, do that. Awesome. This has been great. We're probably at about an hour and a half now, but when my guests are on a tear, man, I just get out of the way. As long as they're cool with hanging out, I'll hang out and we're all better after listening to you. Uh, if you guys want to check out anything that was recommended in this episode, uh, head over to restaurant unstoppable.com slash three zero seven. This is episode three zero seven. I'll link to how to connect to chef Marcus, uh, all the products and services he, re- he recommended in just a summary of today's discussion. All right there, chef, Marcus, there is no questioning. My man, you are unstoppable. Awesome. I feel unstoppable. (laughs) Cheers. Oh, my God. That was a lot of fun. I literally just uh, stopped recording with Chef Marcus, and I just needed to uh, just – I was so jazzed up, just so jacked up after that interview. I wanted to carry that energy into these closing thoughts and – 
I mean, man, I really got my work cut out for me. There's going to be tons of things to link to in today's episode. Uh, but that's what it's all about. I mean, the, one of the big reasons why we do this show is to go out there, find the people who have no really uh, – alternative or alternate agenda like they're here to share what they know to be true and what has helped them and when we can when we can extract that advice extract that at recommendations and extract these tools and put it in front of you so you can then leverage these tools uh in your own life in your business that i mean that just makes uh (laughs) <laughs> that just makes doing what I do uh, just that much more rewarding to make your life easier to know uh, where to look and what you can trust, what tools you can trust. So going to have a lot of work cut out <laughs> to link back to everything, but it will be worth all the work. I uh, can't wait to share those tools with you. Uh, again, restaurantunstoppable.com slash 307. And, um, you know, uh, we got into some stuff today, uh, some deep uh, stuff about just doing the right thing in uh making decisions not based necessarily off what's best for you, but what's best for the greater good. And man, I just think there's such an issue today with culture. And I don't know about you, but I'm not always proud to say that I'm an American sometimes. I mean, I'm so proud of where we were and how we got there in our history, but man, uh, there's just such little impact today. There, our, our lives are so impersonal today. And um, when you think about the human and our higher needs, I mean, we we need purpose. We need a reason to exist. And uh, it's so hard to do that when um, these big c- conglomerates are soaking up all the money and, and it makes it so hard to survive and to do things for the right reasons. Just the craftsman alone, to, to, to survive as a baker, to survive as a a chef to, to survive as a chocolatier or whatever craft, whatever special thing it is that you do really well. I mean, we have higher needs in life and the, the very top of that higher need is self-actualization, filling our purpose, serving our role in society. And it's getting harder and harder to do that. Um, I mean, that's going super deep and that's a, a really a, a stretch, but I don't know about you, but I want to live in a world where people can show up and have their role, serve their community, play a role in, in, in their community and not worry about, paying the bills at the end of the day, not, not making it about the money. I mean, capitalism is a beautiful thing, but when capitalism is paired with greed and, um, just selfish decisions, uh, ego, all that stuff. I mean, nobody uh, as a whole, we just don't benefit from it. So one of the missions of this podcast is to, like I said, during the interview is to make an example of people who get that And don't make it about themselves, but make it about other people. And you'll find out that when you go deep, when you pay attention to the details, when you when you make impact in in the with the people that work at your restaurant, the people that visit your restaurant, when you just go that extra mile to really serve, it will come back around. It's not going to be the easy way. It's not going to be the the fastest way to be successful, but it will be the most impactful way, and it will be the the least selfish way. And um, I had to get that out. And you know, hopefully that kind of this this interview kind of opened your eyes to that and um i also uh gave a shout out to a few of my sponsors uh and i i guys i just want you to know when i do recommend my sponsors when i when i have sponsors on the show it's important to me that you know that i wouldn't put any product and service in front of you unless a previous guest had recommended that product or service i'm really i have a huge or sorry a very uh, small filter meaning i don't let much through when i put it in front of you as a sponsor because uh your your interest comes first so if you want to support the show, uh, if you are finding value in this resource and you, you do want to check out these products, these, these services that are you know supporting or sponsoring the show and that are mentioned, please use my links because that will show my sponsors that uh, supporting what I'm doing is worth their investment and uh, it will, uh, you know, will allow us to keep on doing this and to provide better resources and, and for, it will allow me to go deeper and provide more impact in your lives. So just keep that in mind. And uh, like always, guys, please shoot me an email, eric at restaurantsunstoppable.com. If you have any questions, if you have any recommendations, if you can think of somebody who would make an incredible guest mentor on the show, I would love to to know about them. I would love to make an example of them. Uh, Head over to restaurantunstoppable.com slash tools for a complete list of any and every tool that's been recommended on the show. All categorized, all curated right there to help you guys make your decisions. And restaurantunstoppable.com slash books again every in any book that's been mentioned on the show all right there guys you are the average of the five people you surround yourself with like we talked about in, the sh- in today's episode so choose to surround yourself with the influence of people who are doing incredible things who are just impressive people and you will grow over time you will be- get better but you need that constant influence and 
Uh, again, I always mention Audible, but that's the easiest way to do it. And if you want a free auto- audio book, head over to audibletrial.com slash unstoppable. It will change your life. And uh, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, we're at an hour and a half now. <laughs> so sorry about that, but I think you'll agree that it was totally worth it. Uh, so thanks for sticking around this long if you have. Until next time, peace out.